Okay, so good morning. We are back. We're here now for, this is lesson seven, yes? Is that correct? Oh, lesson five, sorry. Lesson five, see, I've been out for a little bit. Lesson five, uh, we're looking at chapter 17 to 22 of Revelation. And we have just had, I think, a marvelous time thus far, although I've missed out with all of you because I've been gone, had my eyes fixed, and I now, now listen, none of you can sleep now. I can see perfectly. No sleeping in my class back there anymore, girls. <laughs> and listen, I want to also just say thank you to everyone for the cards and the emails and the all, all the words of encouragement and the gifts. One of my friends gave me a little gift, left it on the on the porch no i didn't steal the shirt off her back she gave me my own <laughs> and thank you so much for just that encouragement and those prayers because they really they really do make a difference and i gotta say even though this these surgeries for cataract was the easiest surgery on planet earth as far as no pain no issues with recovery but there, yet still, for, for me, for the reading eye, it took a long, a longer time before I was able to actually read because I'm still having a little twitching going on in this one eye. And, and I, it gets better as the time passes. I think it just needs more healing time. You probably cut something that a little nerve or something and it's still like a little twitch in there. But all that said, easy peasy surgery. So anybody who has cataracts, do it. It's the best ever. You see so well. Um, okay, I want to start with just a very short devotional before we dive into the nitty gritty of what we're going to be covering this morning. Um, we, ha we have a God that is so awesome. And as I said in our prayer before we began the, the video time, um, God tells us ahead of time his plan. And there's a, there's a very clear and very purposeful reason that God does that for us. And so I just want to read a couple of verses for you. The first one is out of John chapter 15. Let me see if I can find John. I do know it's in the New Testament. <laughs> okay, it's John 15 verses 14 and uh, 15. And he says in John 15, you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Then when you move back into the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 23, there's another verse that kind of I think goes along very nicely with this, where it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent or change his mind, right? About the, the plans of God for us, his children. He has said, and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not make it good? And the answers to both of those questions, yes, he will do it. Yes, he, he, will, he will make everything good. Luke 21 is another passage then that goes into the same line of thinking of the plans that God has and how he is telling us ahead of time. And here in Luke 21, Jesus is speaking and he says, even so you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away are we are we now very aware of that having done these drawings this week but my words will not pass away be on guard that your hearts may not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness or the worries of life we don't need to fear the things that we're watching going on right now in the world it is not things are not falling apart is something that i heard on one of the lessons i listened to this last week or maybe the week before he said and she said no things are not falling apart they're falling into place and that for the christian who especially for us as we are digging into this book we see the very things that god said were are going to take place and, and we're not quite there yet we're those things are still yet future but we can see the world falling in lo, in line so that all these things are going to occur just as god has said there is absolutely no no worry that god is a, a liar that he should not accomplish what he says he he will do exactly as he says so he says that day should not come upon you suddenly like a trap 
for it will come upon all those who dwell on the earth, on the face of the earth. Now, who are those who dwell on the face of the earth? What's the reference there? It's not going to fool you, but the unbelievers, those who dwell on the earth, they will, it will come upon them in suddenness, but keep on the alert at all times praying. And in, in order that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the son of man. And I, my closing encouragement to you is out of Psalm 68. And it says here, sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord. To him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times, behold, he speaks forth his voice, a mighty voice, ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the skies. O God, thou art awesome from thy sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. Blessed be God. You almost want to pray after you read those kinds of words, don't you? It's like you're, again, as you did your, your drawings these past three weeks now, in some of those, you literally are just drawn right into the sanctuary of God, and you just feel his presence. Have you ever studied God's word in a, in a way that draws you in in this way? Everyone kind of box at, the idea of having to do so much detail work in the inductive method. Precept is very challenging as far as time commitment is concerned, but it is the greatest investment ever, but it will pay dividends far beyond what any of us even know right now. You do not know what God is going to do in your life, that he is going to use what you have been taught. And now it's not me telling you or a pastor telling you or another teacher telling you and it kind of slips through one ear and out most of it out the other right you retain just smidges of it but having done what you have done the past three weeks you will not forget it you will go back in there and begin to read and those images of what you drew will come right back to your mind you will recall them very quickly and when you drop into a conversation at the school, at work, at grocery store, with your friends over lunch, whatever you're engaged in, all this information now is embedded in your thoughts and God will bring it out. He says his word does not go forth void. It always returns and bears fruit. So you can count on that for, you, for yourself this week. So that is, I think, a word of encouragement. Hopefully that that would uh, remind you that God has a purpose and a plan in this. And even though sometimes these things do look difficult and we are still confused about many points because we're not to the point of interpretation yet, right? We're only in observation. This is called overview. So we're not here to try to answer as Martha kept saying, well, that's a good thing. Put a question mark next to that, right? See, she does exactly what a good teacher will do. We're not ready to answer a lot of those things. And actually, I almost think God was really good to you guys to make me be home for these last few weeks because I have a tendency to want to tell you everything that I know. <laughs> it just wants to come out. But it's so much better if you wait on it so that you find it for yourself. You do it through the discovery of doing these these uh, steps using the tools and then it is something that you learned and you learned it through the holy spirit and through the word itself and through your effort that you've put into it and god blesses that that it is so much better when you learn it that way okay let me just tell you what we're doing here now i want to go back to as i always like to do and teach you a little bit about what we are doing inductively what the process has been so far. Here's what you have done if you didn't notice. We had, uh, we've had, an, I told you all of part two is overview, right? The whole thing is overview. So the first two weeks, we identified major characters and events. Remember we did what was it? Chapter one through 11. And they said, just read through. And when you are, are working with a historical book, a, a record of something, what is it? that you are mostly looking for what are your what are the major things that you're looking for very good thank you you get an a plus and a star 
people, places, and events. When you're looking at history, those are your three major things that you're looking for. So the first time we went through, we just read it and we looked for major people, places, and events, and then we titled our, our chapters, correct? So that was your first time through. And that was really, that's what I call your rough draft title. It's a stab in the dark. You kind of think you know what you're looking at, but you're not totally sure yet. Now, the second time through has been these past three weeks. You did chapter uh, lessons three through five. Um, you visualize the events by drawing them out, right? So that's your second overview. What happened for you when you started looking at your drawings in the middle of the week? Did you ever take time to pull your observation worksheet out and look to see if your titles were good? How many of you changed your titles as you went along? Yeah, I, I can tell you, and, and you know what's interesting, even though I've taught this several times now, I'm still changing my titles sometimes. I go back and go, well, you know what? I'm gonna tweak that just a little. It's not a huge change, right? Obviously it shouldn't be. I mean, if you are doing it correctly, your titles are drawn directly from the text. You're gonna find a verse, that says basically on the whole, what is this chapter about? What is the major message overall in this chapter? Title it in that manner. And then what you do is you go back in and paragraph by paragraph, you note all the different uh, processes that help to explain that title, right? So your, your paragraphs explain your title. The title is supported by your paragraphs. I said that both directions, right? So you get it. <laughs> okay, so that's what you did this last week. By drawing things, then you should have been able to go back. And if you didn't, it would probably be a good time to do it. Um, I can tell you next week now, just to give you a heads up, starting with lesson um, six, you're going to begin to be looking for a a different perspective. So this time you're gonna be looking for the order of events primarily. That's where your focus is going to be. And you're gonna be looking to see what the relationship is of events that are occurring one to the other. How does this event relate to this, the next event? And is it sequential or is, or is it overlapping? Because I can tell you there's a big argument in Christendom uh, with, primarily with different viewpoints of what the rev what the revelation record is all about you know is it a literal kingdom is jesus really coming and if he is coming how does this fall and particularly i think it was chapter 20 i think where there's a big controversy and that's where the predestination and all those things kind of come in to play so that is what you are doing this time through, you're going to be looking for the order of events, their relationships, in particular, the seals relationship to the trumpets, and you're going to be placing these events on a chart. She has given you a chart in the uh, back of, in the back part of your, um, which you called the appendix. Let's see what what pages it is. It starts on page 105 in the back of your appendix, and it's this little chart right here. Can y'all see that? Okay, so that's what you're gonna be looking for. So this is what you're gonna be working on this week. And its purpose, try to, I would suggest that you photocopy this before you write on it so that you can fix it as you're going along if you need to, because I've had to fix mine many times. Or you could do what I'm going to do you can develop this chart on your Word document on your computer and type things in, and then you just cut and paste, <laughs> move things around, right? That's how I love to do it because it's way less work than rewriting everything, right? The other thing is I highly recommend when you do this chart, if you do it on paper, use a variety of colors so that you can match up like things with other like things. And you'll understand what I mean, but there are going to be certain subjects that are going to come up. What kind of things have you already seen just in your drawings that you see repetitively happening as you're going through the book? Bird attacks the people in green. Um, the, the seal trumpet and bowls attack the people in the green, the water sources in the green, uh, the earth. Okay, so she's mentioned she mentioned water and earth and there are a variety of other things and they get repeated and you're going to begin to notice that that's what you're looking for this week these repeated 
events and how do they happen in the unfolding picture? And so you're looking for sequence of things, the order of things, the repetitiveness of things. And you're also going to be looking to see how things relate to one another, right? Okay. And those four, I, I know I was talking to Kristen earlier and she said as she was drawing, she was showing me some of the drawings that, that were insanely good, uh, by the way. She's our new Susan. <laughs> um, our, Susan was in my, more, my class the last time. Oh, she's in the evening class again too now, but I've been out. But um, she's actually an artist, so she draws beautifully. <laughs> and one of the things that Kristen was saying, though, is after she started doing these insane drawings, and then she said, oh, I decided to stop that because it was way too much. But she said, I began to see this. And I'm like, aha, you've already discovered one of the things that you're going to be looking for in this week's homework, which has to do with a pattern of things, how things are are relating to one another. So that is in, an, in essence, my little tip for you this week on what it is that we're doing concerning um, the method of what, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. We are in a process, this next week begins our third time. You're gonna go all the way back again and go all the way through it. So you're looking at revelation on the whole, it's big picture. Again, you're gonna do it all over again, starting next week from a different perspective though. Okay. All right. So hopefully that was helpful to you just to give you a heads up wh where you're heading and you'll, otherwise you're going to be looking at some of the stuff that's in there. Now I got to tell you, my, I went back and looked at my old, um, ch my old work in my old folder. I'm, I was on steroids. <laughs> Insane. I mean, because I, I made, it, it said, uh, mark certain words. Well, if you mark a word, what, what are you supposed to do? make a list on it and so i marked words and then made lists on everything so my homework is like this i just thought oh, i must have had way too much time on my hands but <laughs> anyway and i was much younger <laughs> so we aren't going to go there this time okay so now let's get started so this week we are looking at chapter 17 on now i don't know how she put it up on the screen. That was a pretty good trick, but I, I don't know how to do that because I'm not technical. How'd you do that? Oh, she brought something. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't need it. I didn't. I've never. A projector for your. Yeah, that's. I know people do that. No, because today's our last day with the pictures. So we're good. We'll just hold up pictures. Okay, show and tell today. We can start by looking at what we did for chapter 17. In a way, I kind of don't like to show my pictures because mine have too much information that you learn later that you don't know now. But I can't, I, I, you know, because I know it, I put it in there because I can't not, right? So tell. let's just verbally go through just as you all did before, but I don't think I'm gonna write it on the board. I don't think they could see it. And I do think that you could see it on your observation worksheet. So if you have your observation worksheet open, have a pencil handy and maybe have your colored pencils handy if you have any of those with you. And you can mark it yourself little notes on things, extra things that we discuss that you want to go back and remark or make sure that they are marked. Uh, a big one that this next week you're going to make sure you're doing is all your time indicators to make we've done them once but now you're going to go back and really do them even better this time okay all right so chapter 17 tell me on the whole what do you see chapter 17 is about what did you title chapter 17 there you go judgment of the great harlot now the events that happen in that are are quite uh almost surreal wouldn't you just love to see this in a movie i would love to see somebody literally go through in a sequential order of the way the bible is lays it out for us and show the scenes of these things because it would be just phenomenal now um martha i gave you a dvd okay oh in this bag okay good and if we ever have an opportunity and we don't want to watch the other video that Kay presents, which is lovely, but there is a DVD that actually shows 
all of this in art form. If you are interested in seeing it, we can take a little vote. We can see it. It's really good. It's done by an artist who, and she does a pretty good job. I mean, there's a couple things I saw in it. I'm like, mm, but it's still phenomenal. You'll love it. And, and they read it through. So judgment of the harlot, that's in chapter 17. Who's, who is doing the judging? Whose judgment? God's judgment, right? So it's God's judgment of the harlot. And when he speaks about the harlot, does he name her? Does he give a name to her? Babylon. Babylon. And in the end, what do you see that Babylon literally is? Oh, this is, that's in the next chapter, right? Seven, 18, sorry. Oh, good. That's okay, good. Okay, you're right. I have it right here on my chart. Yes. Verse 18, the woman is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Interestingly, though, when I did my visual drawing, um, I didn't draw a city. Did you? Why not? Because of all the descriptiveness about her that needed to be put into the visual of this chapter, it's almost like chapter uh, verse 18 tacks on that uh, that extra information that it's a city at the end but all this other stuff is descriptive of her so when you visualize it why do you think it would be important for you to literally focus on the woman as a woman and then do the artistic things concerning her in the manner that it says why would that be important what are the kind what are the descriptive things that you see about her. Okay. Okay, so she's called a harlot. She's dressed in purple and, um, and scarlet. And so do you think that's significant that purple and scarlet might be indicating something, right? Uh, she's adorned with gold and precious stones do you think that might be saying something about her have you ever seen a woman dressed like this in real life i have i've been to places of course we were military so in the military we went to a lot of things but i can remember there were certain women on the base where we lived at various times actually more more than once but they were flashy dressers i mean the jewels and the big rings and the, you know, the everything perfect, pristine all the time. But this woman actually made me think about these other women sometimes. So tell me, how did you end up drawing this? What is your, I want to see your visuals. Let's see what we got. Yeah, draw, draw those pictures out, girls. Oh, there you go. Nice. All right. Okay, so that's a good that's a good uh, tip. And Kristen had said she did it. I did it as well. Sometimes in these visualizations, there are some things that are so de detailed or they are difficult to convey in imagery. They're they're more of a message than they are a visual, right? But the ones that are visual, you visualize. The ones that is a message, and you just do what you did. And you make a, a note on the bottom. My warning would be, though, don't get to a place where you, you lean on the writing out part too much. Do as much drawing as you can because the visualization is super important. Okay, so, oh, look at there. That's, oh, look at that lovely Arabian gorgeous lady. She, she's beautiful. Yes. Okay, on the back of the dragon, on the beast. Yes. Gold. And in her cup is what? Her cup is gold. It is a gold cup. Now, there you go. The cup is gold. Now, the one thing you can't do is you can't, you can't convey through imagery that in her cup is abominations and uh, unclean things of her immoralities. You can't really convey that visually. So that would be where as... I made it yeah right good idea yes i yes there you go blood drops <laughs> she's like a vampire and okay so i will show mine for the for the group here for yoshiko and um mary you guys can see my drawing here if you're interested 
Oh, and there's Holly. Hi, Holly. <laughs> okay, so here's my, my woman. Here's the beast that she's sitting on, and here's the lady here. And here I have John and the angel and the heavenly realm. And now one of the things that is really important in um, your notes, paying attention, is where geographically are you when these things are taking place? Are the things that are taking place in the heavenly realm or are they on the earth? Right? Right. John was in the spirit and then he showed down. And so my angel is pointing down to where the woman is and she's on grass, which is the earth in my mind right okay can you see yeah mine's no better than you you got you did a beautiful job yes there's are your mountains but you actually literally did seven months so that's interesting i mean that's a i don't know really what you don't know what it means yet now see this is okay this is perfect though i love this what you uh, can i borrow your your picture to show the ladies here too see how um um, Kathy, sorry, my head is not here all the way. Kathy drew hers and she drew it actually on mountains, right? She was on the mountains because it mentions that in the text. Now, what we're going to find out later is what are those, what do those mountains mean? What is the depiction of them? And we will be doing some word studies. We will be doing some cross-referencing to identify what the scripture means when they use that pictorial image of mountains. Okay, we'll do that later. But for right now, very nice. That's a good, now I didn't do that. It does. Oops. But that's okay. Because one of the things that will happen is even if you get some of the things wrong in your drawings these first time through, it's still a point that you brought to the forefront of your mind visually. Now, the, the next time you do Revelation, let's hope not. Let's hope we're raptured and we're done with this. But if you do it again later, or even if you don't do it later, once you figure it all out, then you'll know what those actually depicted. And so you're absolutely correct. Let's go through and talk this out now as we do it. And what I can tell you is this. Let me show you something that I did so that you'll see how I did mine. On my observation worksheet, I have my title at the top. But then I went through and titled paragraphs by the events that are taking place that relate to my subject at the top. So verses one and two, what was going on in verse one and two that has to do with the fact that the woman is, uh, the, har the harlot is judged. Then I did three through six. And then what does that paragraph show me about the harlot being um, judged? So what I'm saying is, I'm actually able, because of our homework this week, to begin to find my paragraphs and title them. Because we slowed down so much and paid so much attention to our, um, our details about our major subject, which was the title we came up the first time we went through. Now I can begin to say, okay, this talks about this concerning her judgment now this talks about this and you can begin to start marking or developing paragraph titles she did not tell you to do that but it is an exercise of wisdom to do it anytime you can in the scripture make your paragraph titles paragraph titles also help you to figure out do you have the right title for your chapter if your paragraphs cannot support your title your title needs to be tweaked or even maybe changed, okay? Because if you if your paragraphs as you're moving along through it and it's showing you this event, this event, this, or person, whatever the works activity, she's described in this way or that way. Now let me demonstrate it for you as we talk this one through. Chapter 17 is God's judgment of the harlot, right? And so what happens in verses one and two as we open this chapter? It's an angel, okay? And what does the angel do? Now, I think what's interesting also is, who is this angel? One of the seven angels who was holding what? 
one of the seven bowls. Now, do you, how do you think that might relate then to what's going on with this woman in this chapter? Yeah. So this angel who is showing these things to John is also the same angel who had poured out the bowls of God's wrath. Very interesting, huh? And the fact that they gave you that much detail about that angel is significant for your understanding of what's going on in that particular chapter. Where does it go in a timeline? Is there an order to things? You're going to begin to look for that this, this week in your homework. So it's the one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. He shows John judgment of the great harlot. That's in verse one and two right? All right. Now I chose verses three through six for, for my next one. Um, rather than through, did you notice how your observation worksheet, uh, gives you a bold uh, letter for number eight? Um, I backed it up to seven because see the angel begins to make a new statement to him. And so I felt like that was a better break for the paragraphs and I say this to you right now so that you understand these bold letters that uh, precept gives to you they're suggestions for places of break it's it's that person's mind they came up with this there's nothing sacred about it okay it is not anything set in stone it is somebody's viewpoint I personally my viewpoint is it stops after six because he says in number seven and the angel said to me so now it's a new thought so I broke it after verse six. All right. So verses three through six, I broke up. What is the first statement in three? In now, is that a significant phrase that you're familiar with at this point? Okay. We, we saw it before. Where did we see it before? In chapter four, at the beginning of chapter four. And where did we see it before that? And John was in the spirit on the Lord's day in chapter one. So we've seen this and in the spirit uh, statement as a key repeated phrase. This is the third time now that we've seen this phrase. Um, you will be directed this week in your this next week in your homework to pay attention to that as you're writing out your charts in the way that she's going to have you. And she's going to say, do you see some kind of a pattern to this or how does it uh, relate to what's going on. What, how, what is its purpose in the spirit statement? Okay. So pay attention to that. I, I noted it in my, on my list that I made of what's going on in chapter 17, but, um, you just know that that's coming up for you. So because he carried him away in the spirit, we have a break from verse two to verse three, right? That's why I marked that paragraph verse three to verse six. So that's my explanation to you about how I figure out where my paragraphs are. It has to do with the flow of thought where a thought or a message ends and a new one begins. And, and a lot of it has to do with uh, also statements like, therefore, for this reason. Um, sometimes it'll be behold. Sometimes it'll be like in this case, and he carried me away in the spirit. So it's a new thought, right? All right, so now he carried him away in the spirit. And what happened then? What, what, did, what happened to John? What does it say about John? I saw, he says. So John saw something. So it's John saw, and what did he saw? <laughs> what did he see? Okay, a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So now let's go through the details on her again, very quickly. What do you see about her in verses three to six? Okay, there are blasphemous names written on her, or on the beast, rather, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do any of those points cause you to pause and think a little bit about who is this woman and how is she why is she identified in this way right that's what should be going on because if you're drawing all of a sudden you're making these drawings you're going wait a minute what does that mean that she's wearing scarlet what does that mean that she's all adorned in gold and all flashy like that and 
certainly it's pretty obvious when you see that she holds a cup and in the cup is is what Abomination. Uh, mm -hmm. and the unclean things of her immorality so already very clear to you is who is what is this woman about who is she is she a friend of the of god or is she an enemy of God's word, right. Okay, so those things, those identifying factors are what you needed to be paying attention to and starting to say, well, why are those listed? What is the purpose of, of God giving those images? What was written on her forehead? Babylon. Now that's interesting. Who's, who is Babylon? What do we know about Babylon? The Tower of Babel was built in the Old Testament where the idea was we are going to build a tower to heaven and make a name for us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, so with that introduction, we'll stop there because we're going to do study on that. And that's what's going to be really fun. For those of you who have not done any work on that before, this is going to uh, expound your understanding of this conflict that God is going to bring upon the world has a design purpose, remember? He says that he tells us his plans because we're his friend and we're not his slaves. We are his bond servants, right? Which is how this letter is written to us because we're his bond servants, because we're his friends. He wants us to know there's a plan in this. And when he, when he looks at the things that are going on the earth, the one thing he's doing, it seems like, is he's going back to the source of the problem. Where did it all begin? Right? So we're going back to exactly as you said, back in Genesis, where it introduces to us the first time in the scripture, the city Babylon. So here we see this woman, she's Babylon the Great. And then how else is she identified? The, now the mother of. There you go. Yes, exactly. So the, the, the qualifier by titles that are given to her. She's the mother of harlots and she's also the mother of? Abominations of the earth. Yeah, abominations of the earth. So right there you get pretty much all these identifying uh, uh, ideologies about who this woman is. And in the end, what you see about her is what? In conclusion, what, what do you say about her? Well, she's a city, yes, but I mean, how, uh, through the qualifiers are given that that she's got she's in her cup is abominations and immoralities she's called babylon the great she's a mother of harlots what's a harlot right we're going to look at that but in the in the uh picture of scriptural writings what does a harlot represent right why would that why would that qualifier be put into this particular vision that God gives about her. Why a harlot? What is the significance of that particular word? She is someone who misuses a gift of God for personal gratification, economic gratification. And that brings up another point about the harlot and the extreme extravagant wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Said, System. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to get off the It's okay. Um, I think everyone here has been thinking on these already. And we're and the, the good thing is, is no matter, I mean, we don't want to teach too much of it, but what we want to do is, is kind of throw out their thoughts for all of us to kind of go, oh, that's interesting. I should think on that because what happens is, is this is a progressive process of learning. We do not come into a precept class ever and expect to have answers on day one, do we? No, it takes weeks and weeks. And in this case, the book of Revelation is a, basically a year and a half long. And we did a little over six months previous to that in preparation by doing the book of Daniel. So it, it's a really a two year curriculum if you're going to do the t it well. And so little by little we will so it doesn't hurt to throw things out i'm sure that at this point we've all been thinking on this having drawn this visualization of this woman and particularly when you get to chapter 18 where it goes on to give you even more insight about her right okay all right so mother of harlots mother of the abominations of the earth her cup is full of abominations the things of her immorality she's 
licentious. She's immoral. Good morning. She's she's drunk also with what? The blood of the saints. Now, that's, a, I think, a really profound insight about this woman. She is drunk. What does it mean to be drunk? I mean, in the spiritual thinking on this, because this is making a spiritual point. If she's drunk with the blood of the saints, what is going on with this woman? Who is she? Okay. Out of control. Okay. She's a partier. Yeah, she is a partier. Okay. So it does not know when, and maybe not even doesn't know when to stop, but refuses to stop or she doesn't want to stop. Thank you. That's exactly right, Susan. She doesn't really want to stop. This is a woman who's drunk and people who get drunk let me tell you they do it deliberately they're not it's not oops i drank too many whatevers you know if you if you drink to the place that you are drunk you did it on purpose right so she's drunk on the blood of the saints and who are the sa and who are the saints yeah exactly okay so that's three through six now you want to give it a title for that paragraph what, what would you title that segment there who's the major subject there the woman the woman sitting on that scarlet beast so that's what you would title that paragraph does that make sense and then all those details that we just talked about have support to the title that you just gave that paragraph wow is that simple or what now we're going to do it in seven to nine. Now, this one's a little bit uh, more interesting here, as far as a little trickier to see, possibly. Um, what is There's an angel now, right? Again, the angel says something additional. So we open in one about this angel who comes to him and shows him something. He carries him away in the spirit and shows to him the woman sitting on the scarlet beast. Now he's introduced the angel and it says, now the angel said to me, what? Why do you wonder? Why do you wonder? And, what, and then he says, oh, -hoo, oh -hoo, I will tell you, I like that word in this particular book. What does that mean he is, is going to follow? Interpretation. Now, see, in the, in, when we did um, Daniel, it would say, and here's the interpretation. They actually use the word interpretation. Here he just says, why do you wonder? I will tell you. I love that. So you should put a box around that. I will tell you to note, to give you a, a, a clue that you're now going to be giving, uh, be given information. Now, what does he say he's going to tell him about? What is he going to tell him about? Okay, about the, the mystery about the woman so that you'll understand who that woman is. And I'm also going to tell you about the, who else? The beast, so that's the second point he's going to cover. And also concerning that beast, what? The one that it's a beast who has seven heads and 10 horns. So th those are basically four things then. He says, why do you wonder? I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you about these four things, right? And then he follows it um, in verse 9. He opens verse 9 and he says what? Now, how does that connect with what we just talked about? I will tell you. What's going on between verse six and the very first statement in verse nine? He says, I'm going to tell you. And then what happens in the, verse, the rest of verse seven and all of eight? What does he say? Okay, he actually says in verse seven and eight, this is what I'm going to explain to you. And then following that first statement in verse nine, he says, here's the mind that has wisdom. So now he's basically he could say, and here's the interpretation. Are you catching it? So verse, uh, uh, verse seven, all the way to the very first statement in verse nine is a paragraph, right? Seven to nine. And then you kind of have a little bit of an overlap where nine actually can be added back into, oh my goodness, look at that. <gasps> look, vegetables, my favorite. Oh, he, he is awesome. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so what I wanted you to see is how actually verse nine can even be divided. Where what follows what is said, here's the mind which has wisdom. It's almost like you could start uh, the seven heads are in the next verse. Do you remember? Now, remember in scripture also, uh, verses are man made. And they're just, how, how many times um, have you seen in homeworks that we have done, even in years past or even in this one, where you can see how sometimes they've broken paragraphs in the wrong place? Here's an example of where they actually broke a verse in the wrong place. Because, well, actually, you could leave it there and just say verses seven and eight are one statement. But I would have added nine into it because I felt like here is the mind that has wisdom supports, I will tell you, right? Right. And then he opens it, the seven heads or seven mountains. So then beginning in verse, at the end of verse nine, the second half of nine, nine B, as they would call it, and all the way through uh, 14, what does he describe to him? The beast. And then there are sub points to the beast, right? So concerning the beast, the beast is what? How, what, is, what, is, what are the three things that he's going to describe for us about the beast? The heads, the horns, and who the beast itself is, right? So the beast, his heads, and the horns that are de depicted on him. So that's what you're going to be looking at in this paragraph is the beast will go where in the end? What does it say happens to him? He goes to destruction. So in verses, the second half of nine, all the way through 14, it talks about the beast with seven heads and 10 horns and tells us what his demise is, right? What his end is. Tell me the details. Just give me some details about him. Seven heads are That's cool. So concerning the heads, the seven heads are seven mountains that she sits on. So you depicted the mountains under underneath um so that you could would remember that it was about seven mountains which we don't yet know what the mountains represent we have to research that when we get into it but for right now you're paying attention there are seven mountains and they mean something there, there is a message in them right and it talks about those seven mountains are the seven heads so each head is a mountain right okay and then it gives us another interpretation that the, what else does it say about the heads? The he okay, now this is confusing. So the heads are mountains and the heads are kings, right? So what did you just learn by paying attention to the, that detail? Concerning the heads that you're looking at on your beast, when you've drawn your beast with seven heads, I've got seven little heads here on my beast. What are each of those heads representing? A, a king and a mountain, right? And we don't know what the mountain is yet, but we will find out exactly. Okay, good. All right, so that's concerning the seven heads. What do you learn about the horns? Starting in verse 13 and 14. The 10 horns, oh, that's interesting. So when you're looking, when, you, when we begin to timeline, we're not there yet, but we're, we will be doing tons and tons of timelining when we get to that next timelines. We're gonna draw a line on the board and we're gonna sequentially put them on the timeline, right? When we do that, you're gonna figure out um, that as you look at where we stand right now, if we did a time that what will let's go ahead and do a little one just for fun to give us something to look at on the board <laughs> we started with the outline of this book right How, what was written what is what is the outline for the book of uh revelation we see it in chapter one verse 11 i think it was right nine or 11 the things okay Okay, what John saw, that's one segment, what, then what? Uh, uh, that's a better way. What is, right? And what is? What is what is? What is that saying? 
the present day, the churches, right? So we can literally draw a church right in there. I'll give it doors so we know that it's opening. It's what is, and then that what followed it? The things that what? How does it say? The things that will shall take place, right? That shall take place. After these things. Okay, so and after these things is a clock. And what does that tell us then when we look at this? It's a sequential order. It's what John saw. It's what is and the things that shall take place after these things. These things are the seven churches, the letters that were written to them, right? And then after these things then concerns after the, the, uh, the information that we were given concerning the churches and what God expected of them, how they were to be walking with him, how they were to buy from him, right? And so now it's the things that shall take place. So when you're starting to do a timeline, which we're not quite there yet, but when we do, we're going to be looking at these things. And his, as uh, Kristen brought up, he said, she said about the horns that they are kings that have not yet received a kingdom. Okay. So when you look at your sequential, you're going, okay, so where are you and I on this timeline? We're in here, we're in here in the, in the what is, right? And we are, we are being told by John because he is also right here in the what is, he's part of the church. He was all the way back at the beginning of the what is, right? We're somewhere close, we think close to the end, right? And, we, and, we, and she, he is saying to us, these are the things, these are kings, they are not yet received a kingdom. So what do you know about the, these kings that are being depicted here? They're in the future. Does that make sense? Okay, so in the future, these things shall take place. What else do we know about the kings? They will receive authority as in with you for one hour. Wow, that's interesting. So what is the relationship then now between the beast and these kings? Okay, they're, they're collaborating with one another. They have a coexistence to speak of, right? Some kind of a collaboration, okay? And specifically, where do these kings, does it say where they receive their power from? Or where they do with their power? Verse 13, it says, and these, these kings, which have not yet received a kingdom, when they do, they are going to give their power to who? The beast. Okay, now this is going to getting really complicated, right? If this is twisty windy, but it is not hard. Rest your hearts because this really is not hard. Once we get to the place where we're doing the inductive work on this chapter, we're not there yet. When we do, we're going to go back to Daniel. We're going to pull in the information from Daniel. We're going to timeline the whole thing. We're going to plug things in. And each qualifier mark in this particular chapter that does all this right now is going to be laid out in a nice, clean line for you. You're going to understand who these things are. But what you, what you come to realize is that sometimes, like the mountain, it, it, the heads are a mountain, but the heads are also a king right? So one symbolic image sometimes actually can vacillate back and forth between meaning two different things. Sometimes it's the mountain, sometimes it's the king. And you have to discern on that which one specifically is meant. When it begins to use pronouns, that's when, it, that's when you have to have really clearly defined these things in your mind. That's why we're going to be doing what we're doing. Get your pictures drawn, get eventually we'll get the definitions on this you know exactly what they're representing and then you'll be able to to very quickly in your mind make the, that uh, choice is it speaking of this or is it speaking of this right one hour left i don't have time i have i have to have more <laughs> okay well well the reason i'm going through this one though very slowly 
is I'm trying to teach you how to do paragraph titles as you go along. And then starting with the next chapter, we're going to start whizzing, I promise. Okay. Uh huh. The heads are kings. Mm -hmm. And there are seven heads, right? Mm -hmm. Three horns are kings. Mm -hmm. There's ten of them. Mm -hmm. So th that means separate kings? It sure sounds like there is, well, yeah, depicted in there, if you count them up to, in a totality, there's 17. But uh, we're going to, once we merge Old Testament uh, prophecy from Daniel with what we've got here, you'll figure out where those 10 go and where the seven are. Right, right. Well, if there's seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other one is yet future. And what did it just say here about the horns? They have not yet what? Received a, a kingdom. So five have fallen, one is, and we'll talk about it later, but who would be the one is for John at the time he was writing? Rome. Rome would be the one who is. So you're going to figure this all out later, and I'm telling you, it's Easy peasy, once you see it, once you know it, you almost don't even think about it. But right now you look at it and go, oh, how do you explain that, right? <laughs> this is what the value of doing this inductive process, because if you slow down and everybody, if I just told you the answer, you would still not really understand it. But once we do the homework and you do all the work that's necessary to lay it all out for yourself, you'll begin to layer these pieces and this chart that you're going to begin this next week super important do exactly what she asked make sure you fill it in nice and neat uh, either make photocopies so you can go back and rewrite if you have to use a variety of colors if you're doing it by hand so that you can uh, identify things pretty quickly and match things up that are similar right um, and just understand that we will layer it. That's why they call it precept upon precept, right? Okay. All right. So now the first paragraph was the angel shows John the judgment of the harlot, right? It was the angel about the angel showing John. In three to six, it was that John saw the woman sitting on a scarlet beast. That was the next paragraph. Then the next paragraph in seven to nine is that the angel will explain, right? That's your title. I will tell you the mystery of the woman, the mystery of the beast that carries her with the seven heads and ten horns. And then he concludes that in verse nine. He says, so now here is the wisdom. Here is the mind which has wisdom. So that concludes that paragraph. Starting in nine, then we see he begins to explain. The first thing he explains is the beast. And within the beast, there are sub points. But your title for that paragraph, nine to 14, is what? The beast. Yep, the beast, the, it's all about the beast, right? And what happens to him? Okay, so then we're in verse 15 now to 18. We're at the close of this, first, of this chapter, or of this, uh, yeah, the chapter. So do you see again at the beginning of 15, the first couple of words there, what does it say? And he said to me, so again, a new thought, right? A new paragraph. And he said to me, now, what does he describe in 15 to 18? What's the major subject there? It's a, and the waters which you saw where the what? The harlot sits. So he had already said back at the beginning, I'm going to explain to you. And he says, I'm going to explain to you about the woman. I'm going to explain to you about the beast and the seven heads and the ten horns. The first thing he explained was that beast. And those seven heads and those ten horns. But he also said, I'm going to explain to you who? The woman. He goes backwards. Isn't that interesting? He said, I'm going to tell you about the woman and the beast. And then he talks about the beast and then gives the woman. Jesus did that all the time in, in, when he did his things too. We're going to see that later. Okay, so 15 to 18 is about the harlot, right? And what happens to the harlot? What's her, what's her end? What do we see happens to her in this, these verses? Yeah. And what does it say is her demise? They are going to do what? They're going to hang, hey, they're going to make her desolate and naked. They're going to do, eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. 
So it is the destruction of this beast. It says, for God will put it into their hearts, right? So who is the one that is actually navigating these kings of the earth to turn on her, the woman? God. Isn't that interesting? So this is a judgment by God. God uses the very uh, people in her life who first built her up and made her spectacular. Now they're going to turn and they're going to they're going to bring her down. Because why? What is their motivation? What does it say? The very first thing and the beast. What these be, the, these entities that make up this beast? They are going to hate her. Isn't that interesting? First they create her, and then they hate her. And so God's going to use that hatred to turn them so that they will abuse her, eat her, uh, eat her flesh, meaning, you know, utilize everything that they can out of her until she's depleted. And then what are they going to do? Burn her to the ground. Have you, have you ever heard of that phrase? You know, when someone, so yeah, they're going to burn you to the ground, right? They're going to get rid of you. They're going to utterly destroy, destroy you. So that's what we see in this. So verse 15 to 18, the title would be what? Well, no, we had interp the angel will explain in seven to nine. And now we know in nine to 14 is about the beast. And what is 15 to 18 about? The harlot. So it's explaining the harlot. And, and I, in both of my titles, I actually added their demise. In nine to 14, the beast will go to destruction. And then in 15 to 18, the harlot will be burned up. That's how I titled mine. You don't have to do it that way. You pick your title the best you can. But in both cases, one's about the beast. One paragraph is all about the beast. Then, and the next paragraph, 15 to 18, is about the harlot. So now what happens for you in doing this exercise with you this morning? What's going to happen for you is if you take the time to look at your text in this manner, it's going to get a nice flow. How often have I taught this to you guys? The flow of thought. What is the author trying to accomplish? This is the major title of this chapter. Now tell me how in the progressiveness of his, of his writing, how does he tell you about that thing, which you titled it? So we titled God's judgment of the harlot. We see the angel shows John through a vision, the judgment. And, and when he looks at it, he just sees this woman sitting on a great beast. He doesn't get it. And the angel says, what's wrong with you? Let me just tell you, right? I'll explain it. And here's the mind that has wisdom. And then he goes in, in 9 to 14, he tells him about that beast. And then in 15 to 18, he tells him about that harlot. So the beast is not the dragon. The dragon's never called the beast. Definitely. Nope. Nope. He isn't. So You're right. Dragon. You're right. No. So and no. But and yet, even though we know that pretty much all of chapter 17 has been talking about the heads, right? And it's been talking about the woman, but she sits on a great beast. So you really have to draw the whole beast somewhere in here, somewhere along the line. We're going to see how this beast is also depictive, as you said, about this dragon that had been introduced in chapter 12. We actually started drawing this picture back in chapter 12, didn't we? So the first time you drew this particular visual was probably in 12, but you just didn't have the woman on it. Now you have the woman sitting on it. Okay, correct. There you go. So, the, so here's the, the dragon with seven heads. The just, it doesn't, did it have the 10 horns? It did, didn't it? Yes, okay. And the only thing you didn't have in 12 was the woman. But here you drew the same dragon, didn't you? Pretty I much. Oh, you didn't drop. That's because right. I think the dragon has never been called the beast. Same, same thing. The dragon, the right, and the woman, and the woman is not. So now, put. Yes, he does. Well, he does because it says they're kings. What do kings wear on their head? Crowns. And then it says the ten horns are also what? Kings. So you would need 10 crowns on that, on that head too. So see how mine has got crowns all the way down on the horns. So we're going to get, you're going to get more details on this later, but for right now, get as far as you can with it and pay attention to all those details. I want you to be able to outline your chapters as you're going so that you get your flow of thought. Okay. Wasn't it in chapter one, the dragon was the serpent? Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Now she sits on that dragon, but the heads are what are emphasized. Well, yes, and what's interesting is the heads are depicted, and that's what's emphasized in this chapter. It's still a, she's still sitting on a great beast. Did you depict your beast in the same way you did in chapter 12? Well, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a little yeah. different, but if they both have seven heads, yep. they both have ten horns, yep. they're both red, they're both yep. scarlet. Yep. And those are really the only things that are the same. Yep. And when you have, when you have the, the same word of God, the same vision, he's giving you these imagery qualifiers. When he gives you qualifiers about each of the objects that you're looking at, when things begin to match up, that's when you can begin to merge things and, and see, oh, okay, so this and this, and they have some kind of a symbiotic relationship. And as we get to the end of, hopefully we get through the end, you're going to start to see some of those points brought, be brought forward to show you how the Satan in chapter 12 merges with these beasts and what is their relationship, what's their symbiotic relationship with one another. Okay. All right. Huh? Power and authority. Yep. Yes. Right. But we we still don't know exactly all the details on that. So hang on tight. And it's okay if you still have questions. We're not ready for interpretation. All we're trying to do now is visualize, pay attention to details. Don't change your coloring markers. If, if it says scarlet, color it scarlet, right? If it, if it says crimson or whatever, mark it in that same way. If it says gold, mark it in that way. In which chapter? No, she's talking about the B, how they compared to chapter 12. She was making a comparison of chapter 12 and chapter uh, 17. Okay, that's where you probably got lost. But it, we're talking about the beast that is first presented in, in 12. Who is the beast in 12? The dragon, right. And he's scarlet and he has seven heads, right? And, and seven heart and 10 horns, right? Right, exactly. Like in 12, it doesn't actually give you the location of the horns, it just says the beast. Right. Has horns. Yep. Yep. So then you have to kind of tweak it because it's supposed to be the same one over here. We need them all on to one. You'll figure all that out later. For right now, you just need to recognize what is it that has been given to you in the image. The angel has now given you some interpretation. He's not even giving it to you visually. He's saying, okay, this is what it is. Do you remember in Daniel, it did that too. You saw a, a, um, a, a great beast coming up out of the sea and the beast had teeth and it, this is what they were. And it had, uh, or a statue and it had a head, a head and it had shoulders and a chest and it had thighs and legs, had feet. And, and it says, and the feet were, these were kings. I mean, so Daniel gave us all the interpretation. Okay, this is a question you probably can't have an answer to. Nope. But if he saw the vision in 12 and he said, it's a great dragon, dragon, blah, blah, blah. Then when he saw this again, wouldn't it look the same way? It's the same thing. Yep. And why did he use the word beast instead of just calling it a dragon? That's the question. And that's why I'm confused. Yeah, but don't be confused. Be consistent. Be, be consistent. But but do we some do we sometimes use synonyms for things in our own life? Somebody help me think think of a word. Um, something is beautiful and something is gorgeous. But you, if it's beautiful and gorgeous, but they're two words. But oh yeah. I know. Well, we'll have to talk about him when we get up there. Okay. All right. Well, we're up there beneath the altar. We won't be saying how long, oh Lord, until you avenge our blood. We'll be saying, somebody tell me why they didn't do a better job, right? Up all, all of those images from verse um, chapter 12, he's like the harlot. She's sitting on the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns. Right. The, it, but the, right. The emphasis is the harlot and it is also the heads. Right. So that, so although the body still, at least at this point, you can begin to kind of say, oh, that's interesting. 
this dragon still looks like the dragon in 12, but the emphasis in this chapter is about the heads, but the heads are somehow affixed to that body of the dragon. So does that mean there's some kind of a, of a mix of those two images and what, what does that mean? Okay, so now let's move forward. We don't have much time. We, yes. Yep. We're not there for interpretation yet. We're not ready for that. This is the seven heads and uh, the seven mountains, which the woman said on, they are seven kings, five have fallen. One is that I'm in verse 10. The other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Have we had any time references about the shortness of things so far. What have been the time uh, references we've had in this book so far? For a time, times and half a time, for 42 months, for 1,260 days. Here it's for a short, a little while. Okay, so just just mark it as a time reference. We're not ready for the interpretation. Okay, but so all of these, all of these references to the things is the it's the heads, the heads, the heads. These, all these qual, all these identifying statements in here are about the heads. I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that. But, but what is he talking about? He's talking about the heads, right? The heads have this. The heads have that. The was is not as about the twenty; it's more about the kings. Yes. Yes. This then makes it the increase. Okay. okay. All right. So hold. You will get there. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. But the good thing is, as we talk about these things, you guys, this is where you're going to begin to start putting these pieces together. The value of a classroom environment where you can discuss these things. And I know I spent a lot of time in 17, but I really wanted you to understand outlining and how I decide how to mark paragraphs and where I divide them. Don't get distracted if they mark it differently, but you look for the natural breaks and you mark your breaks there and see if they fit what title you give to, to it and how it supports your, your title to the whole chapter. So my chapter is God's judgment of the harlot. The angel shows John that judgment. Then John saw the woman sitting on the scarlet beast, so he saw what he showed him, but then he looked at uh, John and he sees John does not understand, and he says, well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you about the woman. I'm going to tell you about the beast with her seven heads and her ten horns. So the emphasis is on the heads and the horns. And then he says the beast will go to destruction, right? He tells you that in the conclusion, he was, he is not, he's about to come up out of the abyss. He goes to destruction, verse eight. The beast has seven heads and 10 horns. He tells you what the heads are. The heads are kings. The beast is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. He himself is also an eighth. What? Leave it for now. It's fine. Verse 10, the 10 horns receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour so now you got the beast drawn back into that but not a lot of a description except that they receive their their purpose and their power from that beast and they're going to wage war against the lamb but what who's going to win the lamb the lamb is going to overcome okay and then the light yeah that is the important part and then first 15 to 18 is the harlot will be burned up okay so now we're going to go very zip 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 through the last few verse uh, chapters, although I love 19. I might hang a little bit there. Okay, chapter 18, what is your major subject in 18? Again, it's all about Babylon. The first one introduces us to, uh, to it and where the angel says, I'm gonna show you the judgment of her. Then what do you see in 18? Her fall, her judgment, right? And how detailed is this? very detailed so what do you how do you see 17 to 18 comparing then they are together it seems like 17 and 18 should have been one whole chapter right yeah yeah so 17 gives you what big picture 
And what does 18 give you? Details. Details. I hope you're paying attention to those. Okay, those are the kinds of things I want you to pay attention to. And that starting next week, the relationship of one chapter to another and the sequence of order is what you're going to be looking for. So ch uh, chapter 17 told you the big picture about her. Then in chapter 18, now we're going to look at the details. So what did you see? It, uh, it, I want you to make an attempt to outline yours on your own at home. But tell me what you see going on in chapter 18. How is she judged? Fire. Fire. Peg, a plague and pestilence. We're, we're beginning to understand uh, pe peg, uh, plagues and pestilence pretty well right now. I'm, that's a tongue twister, sorry. <laughs> okay, so famine, mourning. Uh, did you notice, whoa, again in there, 15 and 16, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what do we know about whoa? It's not good. <laughs> yes, there is. And whoa, it's not a good statement when God makes that uh, statement to you. Um, okay, so we see in one to three, an angel with great authority again shows up and he proclaims a statement. What? Fallen, 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 fallen is bad. So when he makes the statement, he makes, his, uh, he sta makes the statement as if what? Sorry, it's already done. As if it's. It's an, a done deal. Okay, then um, what happens in four to eight? Another voice. Uh-huh, another voice shows up. Ah, oh, so God is, so what is God doing consistently? I, saw, I heard you all talk about this on when you, when you did your last couple of lessons. What do you see about the mercy of God as you are watching this? How even when God is pouring out wrath, he has mercy on people. And he says to them, come out of her, my people. Why? Yeah, so that you're not going to receive those temptations. So I'd like to see your, your pictures on this. What do you, how did you draw this? Come out of her, my people. So when he says, come out of her, my people, and what did we, what did we determine at the close of chapter 17 that th this Babylon is? It's a city. It's a great city. So let me see your pictures. I have two pictures. For the, for oh, okay. Because I, I did some. So I did Babylon. I, I did a tower over here. That's fine. Oh, okay. Very good. Now that's a good idea. I like that. All right. Okay, so that part covers which part of your of your chapter? Verses four and five. Well, I didn't draw. I just wrote the, the scripture for four and five that come out of her my people. I didn't draw. Oh, right. Well, I okay. Well, I drew people coming out of her. Okay, show, tell me what you got here. You're did okay. Good. I did. Three paragraphs, three, three pictures. Oh, you did. Okay, that's okay. I did that too on some of mine. It's hard. Yes. You're right. Okay. So, okay. So Susan, on her drawing, she has her paper divided into three sections, and she progressively does basically what you did, paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. Isn't that cool? Already, you're, be you're already beginning to see your paragraphs by the fact that you had to divide your picture up, okay? Very nice. And yours is always so neat. You got all that nice, neat writing. Very nice. Awesome. Katie, this is weird, and I'm sorry to bring in something really strange here, but has it occurred to any of y'all that the second chapter of Genesis starts out with a woman who just makes a little oh, <laughs> yeah yeah you know in a way it does what's going to be even more interesting is when we go into like you mentioned earlier babylon itself and see what happened at babylon and since the comparison in this is about babylon we're going to compare babylon and babylon and see what was happened but yes sin is the beginning of all of it right it's the it's where the mess all began. Okay, well, I'll show you my picture. I did draw a city. I drew, here's that the woman, the harlot, dressed up still. 
uh, she hasn't figured out that she's doomed, but here's my people coming out of her because God is going to begin to pour out these judgments upon her, pour out judgment upon her. So I'll let you look at that. Don't keep it though. I have to have it back. Yes. The millstone was really cool. Okay. Yes. So that was going to be my next question. We saw, we saw some different groups of people here. We saw in nine and 10, who? Kings, kings the kings of the earth. And what are they going to do? Well, yeah. right. They're going to weep. 11 to 20 talks about who? Two groups, merchants and shipmasters. Very good. Good job. Then in verse 21 to 24, what do you see? Angel. The angel again with that millstone that you're talking about, throwing it into the sea. And he says about that imagery that he produces for uh, John to see at that moment. He says, so will Babylon be thrown down, right? Uh, no longer the sound of music, marriage, craftsmen, no light. All the nations are deceived. So then there's this whole list. And the whole list relates to the subject of the fact that in 21 to 24, it says Babylon is going down, right? It will be thrown down with violence and found no longer. Okay, that's chapter 18. All right. All right let me put that back here. I know. <laughs> Very Why good. And well, and that's a really good part. I have kings weeping. This is really funny. See my little weeping king, the kings of the earth are weeping and here's the ship people. They're saying how sad they are that she's dying. And, you know, I mean, you try to get as much as you can. The point is this, this tool has made you slow down and pay attention to all the details. Who's doing what? What is the relationship of one thing to another? You get all that if you draw it out. If you don't draw it out, you're just hurting yourself because your understanding is not going to come as easily if you don't do the drawings. The drawings are so important in this. Okay, 19. I love 19. Fantastic. I do too. I wish it were today. Okay, so I actually had to do two separate sections for mine also. Look at that mess. That's the biggest mess, but the top is one and the, the second is here. The first one, what do you think it's about? What is the first part of the book about? Yeah, and, and who's coming? Uh, or no, it, it's all about rejoicing, you're right. They're rejoicing. Okay, and then the second part is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he, and he tells them, what are they coming for? What's the event? What's the major event in 17 to 21? The supper. Thank you. I'm going, did anybody miss that great supper? There's a, and what is the contrast to that? There's the great supper of God. What is it in contrast to? Well, that's not a contrast. That is the same thing. The great supper of God is what? The, the birds doing what? Eating those flesh the flesh of men and kings. So that's called the supper of God. What's it in contrast to? The marriage supper of the lamb. Isn't that exciting? So there's two, two kinds of suppers here. One is the, the marriage of the lamb. The other is the supper of God, right? Did you notice that was a contrast? If you did not notice that, please pay attention, make a note in your column, just pencil it in so you can go back and pay attention to that because these are two different events. So in verse, in chapter 19, then there's rejoicing in heaven, as you said, and what are they rejoicing about? Why are they rejoicing? Yeah, the harlot. So what, what does that tell you about verses one through five? It could have gone back at the end of the other chapter. Although I understand what has happened, however, is geographical change. In chapter uh, 17 and 18, where are we geographically? On the earth. Is, where are we in 19? In heaven. 
So here's the switch. So pay attention to that. If you do, if you aren't paying attention, mark it in a distinctive way or just pencil it. I put it just at the top of my um, column here. I, I just did it this way. I just said in heaven so that I would notice, okay, we just left the earth. Now we're in heaven. Okay. So in the heavenlies, we see them rejoicing over the fact that the, the harlot was judged, right? And it gives you a picture of 24 elders and the four living creatures again, right? Okay, so those could be in your drawing or should be. Um, here's mine. My, here's my throne. This is in heaven. This is the first part. Here they are around the, th the throne again. Um, what does it say? I can't even... Uh, after Babylon is judged, this is in the heavenly. This is all the heavenly choir that he speaks about, a great multitude of people, right? Hallelujah, her, uh, her smoke goes up forever and ever. They give praise to God. The marriage of the lamb has come. So this is when you want to pay attention to that there's a marriage taking place here. Um... It has to be six to 10. Uh, verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come. And what else? The bride has made herself ready. That is a major event. No kidding. Because what are you and I right now today in our relationship to Christ? Well, we are bond service, but if you're talking about weddings and marriage, where are we in that right now? We are the betrothed of Christ. We are betrothed. We are engaged, engaged. We're, we're in the engagement period. We're in the church age. We are, we are betrothed. Betrothed of Christ. Okay. But over here, it says, when we get into this section, we're going to get to the place where it says the bride has made herself ready. We're getting to that at some point. And, and where are we? In heaven. Okay. So we're somewhere. We're in the heavens. And while we're in the heavens, we are going to make a switch. We're going to go from being the betrothed, engaged, to now being his wife. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? This is in verse, this is in 19. <laughs> yes, I do. I do have a, I have a lovely video, but it's lengthy. Um, we could do it uh, when we get to that part. And I don't know what point it would be appropriate to slip it in, but yes, I have one where it shows a Canaanite wedding that they now come across concrete, uh, historical archeology span kinds of records about what they did, uh, technically in a Canaanite wedding. And Christ was using that as his imagery when he taught about us being his betrothed and that, that he's going to prepare a place for us and he'll come and receive us to himself. Right now we're waiting. He's preparing a place for us. One day we will be resurrected and brought before him and we will be the bride of Christ made ready. And when we return with him, there will be a supper of some kind for us as well. What did it say at the conclusion in verse nine? And he said to me, what? to the marriage supper of the lamb. So it, by looking at that, those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb, has the marriage supper occurred yet? No. Is it even really addressed in here? Is it addressed anywhere else after this, in this, in this writing of Revelation? No. So what, what that tells you is, that's interesting. We, we will go from being betrothed to being married as his bride made ready, right? But there's a, and he says, blessed is those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. So there's a supper, a marriage supper, a wedding feast, like you do after we do a wedding. What do we do after, after we get married? We have a big uh, wedding supper or dinner, right? Everybody dances and eats and celebrates. Bride, bride is already, so it's like, like an extra. Oh, 
I've always kind of thought of it from that perspective, but also it could just be, if you are the bride, are you invited? Okay, so it could be both, right? It doesn't necessarily mean there's additional people. It's just, we're going to pull in parables. We're going to pull in the teachings that Christ has had, and we're going to merge it all together and get the full picture so we understand what is the, what is, how did Christ portray the visual for us in reality of what's going to happen for us in the spiritual, right? We have a physical record for us through the Canaanite wedding. These, this is the process that they took, right? We know where we are right now as betrothed. We know one day we're going to be his bride. And when we come back, we come back as helpmates, right? What have we learned so far about in Revelation? What happens when we come back with him? What will we be doing? Ruling and reigning with him. We're his helpmate. So isn't that awesome? So we're going to learn all that later. <laughs> I know, I know later, but here we're laying down the picture so that you begin to see the, the pieces of everything. That's, this is a very intricate writing. This is just absolutely almost super, well, almost, it is supernatural. The way God laid this out in picture form, the pictures for us in, in some ways, they are complicated because for us, we have to go back in history and try to figure out what was the imagery really meaning. They understood it back in the day that it was written probably even better than we do because we've lost some of that, right? In our culture and in our traditions. Plus, not to mention we're Gentiles living on a totally different continent, right? So we have to work a little bit harder sometimes at getting all these pieces. Okay, so rejoice in, in heaven in the first five verses. We see in 6 to 10, a great multitude, again, rejoicing. And he says it can, in that particular passage, the major thing is what's what has come. The marriage of the lamb has come. That's your major theme there, 6 to 10. Uh, then 11 to 16, you get heaven opens up, and now what happens? I love this passage. <sighs> Behold, a white horse. Woohoo! We, we have, I mean, this is when you want to sing, you know? He, as he judges, he wages war when he got so. This person who comes on this white horse is coming for war. And who follows him? His armies follow. See how we're re referred to there? We're referred to as armies. And we know that, that um, it's us because how are they dressed? In fine linen, white. What did we learn in chapter, uh, uh, what was it, three, uh, two and three about the churches? What are, what are the, one of the things that you have to do in order to be by the garments that are white and clean, right? So he, that's exactly right. Listen, if that doesn't relate to marriage, I don't know what does. <laughs> you, it's all hallelujah. Let's have a supper. And then it's like, it's all war. Living, living out your marriage is work. That's why we're called helpmates, right? And what's really interesting in, in the case of, of God in our marriage to him, husbands are also helpmates right? Why women and men both are helpmates for his bond servants. That's why the letter is written to the bond servants. And when we come back, we will come back as warriors and as rulers. We will rule and reign with Christ, but we will be his workers. We will be under his authority, under the authority of Christ himself, right? This is where the complication comes though, when uh, there are varieties of interpretations about Revelation. Some churches teach that it's not a literal coming. That th where this says he comes, my question to you would be this. If you have a conversation with someone and they say, no, it's not literal. Jesus is not coming. There's not going to be a real kingdom on the earth. He's not really going to be here, right? But wait a minute. Everything else that we've learned so far, like, for instance, this, the letters to the churches, were they literal? Did they really happen? Are they actual geographical locations on a map? Can you go to these places even yet today and see them, touch them, right? I've lived there. One of them was my home for three years. 
So I know exactly where these are. So it's literal. When you move to the next segments and some of these events that we're talking about, earthquakes and fires and, and different kings arising. And, and then when we get to the part like we, we did today, five have fallen, one is, one is yet to come. And when we look at that, we know that the one that is for John was what, what kingdom? Rome. So if that's literal, and it is, why would you then step forward into the next chapter and say, oh, it's not literal? Yes, that is what they do. That's exactly, Daniel has the clearest picture. That's exactly, we are going to lay Daniel in on top of this later. Daniel has an exact name for each of these things. And so you, the imagery that's given to us through Daniel, we layer on top of what we're looking in Revelation, and that's how it all fits together. And you cannot deny that it's not literal. So here it is. He says about himself, um, his name is called the word of God and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Now I've had a hundred questions about the white horses. Uh, now in my drawing, what did you do on your drawing? Okay, I have Jesus on what? It's, it's actually a black ink pen, but it is, <laughs> it's a horse. <laughs> Now, what's the imagery of a white horse? So we're going to look at that. We aren't ready to dive into that right now, but there's an imagery about the idea of the difference between his coming. His first coming, he came on what? A donkey. Why a donkey? And what is that imagery? Now he's coming on a white horse. Why on a white horse? Yeah, now he's coming out of heaven. He's coming to the earth. Okay. Right. And with a sword in his mouth. Yes. And, and it says concerning that, that he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress and the fierce wrath of God, the almighty on his robe and on his thigh is written king of kings and Lord of lords. Yes. Woohoo! We all sing hallelujah. Okay, now, and then what follows immediately is verse 17 to 21. What is the major event going on there? What is it called? The great supper of God. And how that supper is defined for us is what? Well, if Jesus came with his armies and they came for war, what's happened? The war. Now what happens? The, they, they lost and the birds of the air the birds of the air are called by god the vultures and the the birds that eat flesh to eat that flesh of these dead men there's going to be so many and we're going to get more of that story as we keep moving okay so that's chapter 19 you see a nice progression of events how that falls in chapter 20 then opens up with what yeah we're on to the next chapter 20 are we going to make it well, 10 more minutes, so we, if we, oh, oh, I'll get 10 minutes, okay. If I go a little quicker, yeah, we, we'll be okay. I'll make sure that we get through, okay. Now, chapter 20, what is, what are the three major events? There's a, well, what happens in verses one through six? What's cool? What is the, the we, we do see some subtitles in there, but what is the major thing in those? Yes. But, and then there's, what is in verse four? Those who do what? Uh-huh. Right. And then, and then it closes with, and, the, and the, these people who came to life and Christ does what? For a thousand years, what does Christ do? He reigns. So what is the major event? Christ reigns for a thousand years. Yeah, or the thousand year reign or the millennial reign, however you want to call it. So that within that millennial reign, what all is going on? Satan is bound. People are resurrected. That second, re the, the first resurrection, right? Um, and, and even who gets resurrected and gets put into places of, 
of ruling are just are defined for you there right yeah some of them are some of them were uh he saw th now very interesting and i don't want to go into it right now but i want you to pay real close attention to it um it says at the ver opening of verse four then i saw thrones and they sat on them who's the they okay you have to figure that out well how do you figure it out when you're reading anything that's literary? You're reading a log and then they mention a they, a pronoun. Right. What does that tell you? It was mentioned before. So what do you have to do? You have to back up to find out who the they is that would be put on thrones to rule with Christ. Who do you think it would be? Armies. It would have to be the armies that are coming with Christ because it's not the ones that are going to be killed and eaten by the vultures, right? So it has to be the ones who come with Christ who are going to rule and reign. And does that fit with our doctrine about what we know about us as the church? Do we rule and reign with Christ? Yes. Okay. I, I always have looked at it like the 12 patriarchs real, excuse me, and then the 12 apostles. Well, you're talking about the 24 elders that sit around the throne then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not what we're talking about, but okay. Yeah. Well, th do you see the first word and? So there's two different separate groups of people. One is they that they sat on them. So it's something that came before. And I saw souls of those who had been beheaded. So then there's a secondary. There's two groups of people that are made mention of here. Yes. So we're going to work all that out when we get into the details. But what you see is the bottom line, the major thing, verses one through six, is that thousand year reign and all the different things that happen in that thousand year reign. In seven to 10, then that what happens? What after the, did you see what op, verse seven opens? Then when the thousand years are completed. So that tells you right there, the first six verses were about the thousand years. Okay. So starting in seven through 10, then what happens there? Satan is released and what occurs? A war. So what is the major event? For what? There you go. You, you tied them both together. Okay, so there's going to be a final war. What is this war called? How does he refer to it as? Gog and Magog. Now, let me tell you something. Gog and Magog is a phrase that's used often in scripture, and it refers to a variety of kinds of wars. There's going to be more than one Gog and Magog, and there already has been several, where God refers to many of Israel's enemies in that uh, in previous days, the days of Ezekiel and days of Isaiah and the days of whoever else, that Gog and Magog come up against Israel over and over. Here's another one we're going to see. And in this case, it tells you where do they come from? The four corners of the earth. So the whole earth comes again. Think of this. Who's ruling and reigning for a thousand years? Christ himself in righteousness and his righteous helpmates, us who are ruling and reigning and yet what happens when satan gets released people god he he is used to bring these now what's very interesting is how quickly does this war occur how wh where are the casualties who who is the casualty everybody that's outside the city the yeah all those who came against her right does it tell you at all that for instance remember back in chapter 12 the, it's, it talks about the dragon that he pursues the woman, he kills her child. Then later he pursues the woman again. And when she hides in the wilderness for a time, times and half a time, then he begins to pursue who? Her other children. Her other children. Now here it says this time another war, but this war, you don't see any aggression against the children of God. All you see is what? these people who come against the city but what happens to the city nothing nothing and uh, nothing isn't that awesome nothing happened and how does god destroy them is it a big bloodbath no it's a boom fire and you keep that in mind when you flip in to uh well, well when we move over to um the end of this what happens then after that in 11 to 15 
That's right. There's a great white throne judgment. Now, underneath that title, there's a variety of things that happen. The very first thing to happen is uh, what happens to the earth? Ah, yeah, it flees, right? It says, um, it, there's a great, yes, verse 11. Him who sat upon that throne, uh, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. So what does that tell you about the heaven and the earth at this point? They're gone. And if you want a little bit more information, flip over to 21, verse one, what does it say there? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had what? Passed away. Passed away and there's no longer any sea. Well, well, we're going to find out what that means, right? Okay, no place is found for them. And then he says, I, I saw the dead, the great and the small standing before the throne. Books are open. So how did you all depict this? This is uh, Revelation 20. Here's my drawing on that. Lift it up. Okay. So the great white throne judgment. What did it say is, uh, about the events that happened at the great white throne judgment? Books are, open. Books are open, right? And also another book called what? Book of, book of Life. And the dead, which are from the earth, right? So here's the earth all the way down here in this corner. It says they come before God's throne. The books are open, they're judged, and then what happens to them? Where do they, what happens? They, they go to where? The lake of fire. No, <laughs> you can't see. <laughs> so here's my lake of fire. Here's the people, here's earth. Earth is gonna fl flee away. See here, earth is gone. They go before the throne and then they are judged and, and they are cast into the lake of fire. So that is the great white throne judgment. Okay, I'll put, I can let you guys look at it. There comes a point when I have to tell you, I want you to make a copy of all <laughs> I do. Okay, I can do that for you. Yeah, no problem. I'll do it because I understand it's hard for all of them, okay. But listen, just remember, my mind is a real mess. <laughs> and my abilities to draw really stink. I do not have the talent my daughter has. My daughter is actually an artist. She got her degree in college. She's a, a, an art major. But wow. me, I'm not. I'm not that talented. <laughs> but you are welcome to have them. OK. Yeah, OK. All right, so that took 20. Now we're at 21. Am I close? All right. 21. So chapter 20 covers the thousand year reign, the war of Gog and Magog, and the great white throne judgment. Everything else is details, and they should have been on your artwork, right? So you had three major events in chapter uh, 20. Now, 21, we really have only one major thing happening, one major statement, but I did get it broken down into two paragraphs, basically. Also, I want you to know at this point, I included the first five verses of 22 with chapter 21, okay? Because it is so, it's so confusing if you don't. The first five verses of 22, what, is, what does it talk about there? Of the first five verses of chapter 22. It's again about a city, what city? The New Jerusalem, right? It says in the New Jerusalem, what's there? A river of life, the water of life, and the tree of life. What's not there? No longer any curse, right? What else is there in verse 3? The throne of God and the Lamb, they're in it. And the bond servants are there, and, and they do what? They serve him. Now, back up to the beginning of 21. Now, let's see how this all flows, okay? Because that's like a conclusion statement in those last few verses at the top of 22. I'm not sure why they put them over there, but I would not have done it. I would have included them in the previous chapter. 
Okay, so then in 21, not that I'm any better than anybody else, but I'm just saying that's how I see it. Okay, so Revelation 21, the cool thing about this is what I hope I'm demonstrating for you is there's nothing wrong with occasionally changing the way something, even if you love the, a, a person or a leader, and I love this Bible, but there are people that made segment divisions and and chapter paragraph changes right so just keep that in mind that if you are, if you can legitimately justify why you're moving something from one chapter back to the previous one or forward to the next one do it there's no law and you're not you're not sinning by changing how you see the flow of thought but if you do, if you see it, once it's pointed out to you, do you agree that the first five verses of 22 really need to be back? It's like the conclusion statement to what's in that city, because what follows in 22, starting in verse six, talks about what? Yeah, almost. Yes. Do you remember when we opened our study in this book in way back in part one? where we made a, a comparison of chapter one with chapter 22 and we saw how they were literally bookends he says he's coming in there in that chapter one and he talks about these various things that i'm coming quickly the time is near and when you get to 22 uh, starting in verse six again he's saying and he said to me so there's an opening statement these words are faithful and true and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must what? Soon take place. That is exactly what we said. The things that shall take place right here. And then he goes on to explain how he's coming. The time is near and that he is coming quickly, right? I'm coming quickly. And then the response, the, 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 the harmony of the response in verses 14 to 18 is what? concerning his coming come lord come the bride and this and this uh the who's it? the uh the spirit and the bride say come and the one who hears says come let the one who is thirsty come let the one who wishes to take up the water of life without cost i testify to you and he goes on he says he who testifies to you about these things what i am what coming quickly that's in verse 20 okay so what you see is 22 is like the book into 21 but that rendition of those events don't really start till verse six the first five verses are still talking about yes right ex opening and a closing that's exactly right and he reiterates at the end i am coming quickly i'm telling you all these things and i am coming quickly what does that do for you and i it reassures us that he's coming and it's coming quickly although it's been quite a while that quickly word there you go when quickly it will be fast yes and what else does it do for you and i i am coming quickly Get busy and do what? Witness, because that when he comes and the saved go with him, who's left behind? The unsaved. And what did they have to go through? Everything that we are looking at here, this world will have to endure. And you do not want your friends and your neighbors to be here and left behind. I know it's, it's a scary thing. Okay, so 21, uh, it is done right what how did you title your chapter well starting in 2021 20, okay there's a new heaven a new earth and a new jerusalem yes do we get much information about the new heaven or the new earth other than a statement that it's going to come not really what is the major subject the new jerusalem and concerning the new jerusalem he introduces it to us in verse uh 10 one of the seven angels again about the has the seven bowls right so what does that tell you about timelining of when this event happens if it's one of the seven angels angels who had the seven bowls 
the bowls we know have now been poured out. So where are we in a timeline? All the way at the end, right? You can, you can, add, you can tack all this at the very end of all these things that are going to happen that we're looking at that are so horrific. And he carried me away in the spirit. There's that phrase again to mark it. And the angel came, uh, said, come here and I'm going to do what? I'm going to show you what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. That's a very interesting statement. I'm going to show you the, the bride, guys. I'm showing you the wife of God. The wife, the one that was betrothed, who is now the bride. I'm going to show you the bride. What does he then talk about from that verse out on? Jerusalem, the city. Huh, that's interesting. So if he's going to show us the bride, but he's showing us Jerusalem, what does that tell you about the bride? What did we just say at the, as we read the conclusion in verses 1 through 5 of 22? Where is she? Where is the bride? In the New Jerusalem, with God at his throne, serving him as his bondservant. So do you see how important it is to put 1 through 5 with this? Because Jerusalem, he says, I'm going to show you the bride, but then he does nothing but talk about the city. He gives you all the details the walls, the, 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 the gates, the, um, what the streets are paved, uh, how everything measures out dimensionally, the, the uh, foundation stones and the names that are written, right? You get all these details, but it gives you all the details about the Jerusalem itself, about the city, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it? The concrete qualities of the, of the place of where we will be. But then in one through five, he says, and then I showed, the river of life i showed you the tree of life and i showed you that god is there and what is not there no longer what any curse we're going to learn more about what that statement means no longer any curse but what will be there the throne of god and the throne of the lamb and they will both be in it and who will be there his bond servants now very interesting verse three then is what he says back at the beginning in verse um, ah, nine. So nine and then three of the next chapter go together. 21, nine and 22, three. Did you get that? That flow of thought? In 22.3, on, he says, and I, and the God's going to be in it, the lamb is going to be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, face, whose face? God's face or Jesus's face. And his name will what? Be on their foreheads. There will no longer be any light. They will not have need of the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. They will reign forever and ever. That's the bride. Come here. I'm going to show you the bride. He shows the city and he shows us in it and he shows the throne and us in his presence, seeing him face to face. Isn't it cool? Genesis 2, Paradise Lost. Yeah. In Revelation 22, Paradise Returned. Returned. Exactly. That's reestablishing of what God, what we lost in there. So your pictures on that in 20. One through six, oh, whoops, 21 is where we were, right? 21. Um, here's, <laughs> here's my Jerusalem. I know it's, it's a mess, but there's my foundation, all the different colors and the names on it and the gates with all the names of the tribes and the, the pavement is gold. So everything's bright, you know, shiny. I know, silly. It's a silly picture. It's a silly picture, but it's, it, it's really great. The old heaven gone, the new heaven here, heaven and earth. But we didn't get any details about the new heaven and the new earth, did we? So did we do it? I think we did. How much, how, how am I on time? Ooh, just like. Technically, we didn't start until 7 after, so technically you're on time. Oh, technically I did it. <laughs> so there. Yay. Thank you. I hope that was helpful, you guys. Chapter 21, it's done. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And in 22, I am coming quickly. Okay, we did it. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week.